rom-coms go? When I was a kid, my favorite stories were love stories. Not the dramatic ones or the sweaty ones, but the ones that could make me laugh and cry. The characters were simple, the plots were convoluted, but it was also endearing that even when I knew every plot twist and punchline, I could rewatch them again and again. And nowadays, you don't really have a choice since we stop making them. Or at least it feels that way. But is it true? To figure it out, we are diving into the history of rom-coms, finding the factors that decides if a film gets made. Then there's no movie at all. And even writing one of our own. My heart started beating a little bit. <laughs> Thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring a portion of this video and to our patrons for supporting the channel. Okay, context. Back in the 2010s, there was this growing sentiment that romantic comedy movies were a dying breed. The golden age of rom-coms that started in the late 80s, early 90s, and blossomed in the 2000s was over. All we had left was Friends with Benefits and Friends with Benefits Ashton Kutcher edition. And this is devastating for people like me who love good rom-coms. So I want to figure out what it's going to take to bring them back. But it's been a while since I learned about this in the mid-2010s, so I should probably start by checking if rom-coms are really gone. Luckily, the movie database API exists, so I quickly coded some calls to find every rom-com movie made since 1990, and apparently, they never die. However, we don't actually care about the sheer number of romantic comedies being made, we care about the number of good ones. To try and quantify that idea, I looked for patterns in rom-coms I've heard of in order to find some combination of votes and ratings to draw a lower bound. The least good rom-com that is still good enough. Once I figured that out, it was obvious that rom-coms had died, but it also became clear that rom-coms are back. Check this out. The 1990s was near the beginning of this trend of making more and more rom-coms, until the whole thing peaked in the mid-2000s. Now this can be easily explained through budget and revenue. There were a lot of early low-budget rom-coms that made massive gains. But over time, despite consistent spending, there were diminishing returns. And that's despite pretty consistent ratings. All of that led to the very real lull in rom-coms in the mid-2000s. But if you look past that into 2018, you could see that rom-coms are back with massive titles like Crazy Rich Asians, to All the Boys I Loved Before, and The Princess Switch. Now, 2020 slowed everything down, including rom-coms, but I can't help but wonder if those last few years of the 2010s were just this short blip, this short-lived revival, or a signal that rom-coms are coming back for good. I figured the answer lay in why rom-coms died in the first place. Sure, they were making less money, but how did that happen? Because if the genre found a way to solve these problems, then there's a good chance that the revival is gonna stick. So, after looking through old articles, but mostly just watching some of the best and worst rom-coms of the past 30 years, I have a theory. So I rearranged my whole apartment, set up a teleprompter, and memorized the aesthetic and speech patterns of video essayists in order to tell you why rom-coms die. Many have tried to blame it on the shortage of leading women and men in the modern rom-com era. Back when we had Julia Roberts and Tom Hanks, it was easy to convince audiences to watch their favorite white people fall in love. Unfortunately, when they left the genre to avoid being typecast, audiences struggled to connect with their replacements. But I think that lack of connection goes deeper than just celebrities. I think that rom-coms have a fatal flaw. A romantic comedy is a modernization of the fairy tale love story. Characters always have enough money working jobs that are either ridiculously fake or clearly written by someone who has no idea what a corporate job entails. In two weeks' notice, Sandra Bullock is the head of legal for a billion-dollar New York City real estate corporation, and her main job is stapling. Apartments are massive, morals are unquestioned, and everyone is hot. Rom-coms were unburdened by reality, which makes for fantastic escapism until there's nowhere left to run. I think the fundamental flaw of rom-coms is that you can't underpin the story with realistic drama. It's too heavy. So, stakes need to come from concept. What if she falls in love with a voice? What if he's stuck in a time loop? What if she forgets every day? What if he is asleep? Unreliable narrators and quick banter made it easy to get all of the tension from the concepts without any of the horrifying implications. But as the genre boomed and audiences became more sophisticated, some concepts were too familiar, and others were difficult to look past. Eventually, there was only one place left to go reality. From Knocked Up to Silver Lining's Playbook, these rom coms had the courage to ask what if rom coms weren't funny or romantic? I'm sorry, that is so mean, that's so mean. Okay. I should be clear, that novelty probably contributed to these movies' successes, and they were successful. 
But at what cost? The best rom-coms Hollywood had to offer were barely rom-coms at all. The fairy tale was over, which is why I thought Hollywood killed it off. Until I found this book like two days after I formed that theory and I'm gonna let him speak for himself. Uh, my name is Scott Meslow, and I am the author of a book called From Hollywood with Love, The Rise and Fall and Rise Again of the Romantic Comedy. I think the story of the death of the rom-com is really the story of the death of the mid-budget studio movie. When it started to become every $200 million superhero movie also needs to be part of a cinematic universe and make a billion dollars ideally and pave the way for the next billion dollar grocer. We're gonna make those kinds of movies and we're gonna only bet on those home runs. When it comes to rom-coms, a genre that you know, must be said has always been sort of uniquely devalued by Hollywood uh, for all of the depressing reasons you'd expect. It was easy to scapegoat them as, as the movies that were getting uniquely devalued in this larger trend happening in Hollywood. After all that media theorizing, it was capitalism? No way. So to double check, I ended up going back to the movie database and finding the top 100 releases for each year since 1990. I found their budgets, adjusted for inflation, and then calculated the quartiles to try and find any meaningful trends. I did a statistical significance check and, Around the 2010s, there was a significant decrease in the amount of lower budget films being made. What a surprise, the journalist who did in-depth research and interviews was right. If you are interested in hearing more of what he has to say, our full conversation is available to our newsletter subscribers and his book is even better. Anyway, I should say that even though he is right, that doesn't mean that I am wrong. Rom-coms were becoming less profitable and it could have been for the reasons that I described. All of this just means that the final nail in the coffin wasn't reality, it was Iron Man. The good news is that this suggests that the key to rom-com salvation is a lot simpler than resolving a fundamental genre flaw. What happened that Netflix suddenly wanted a million rom-coms? It was championed by a couple of programmers there who realized that when they were licensing movies, some of these older romantic comedies were doing way better than the metrics might indicate. It was not only that people would watch the movies, that they would return to them, thereby keeping them indefinite subscribers because they want to be able to watch that whenever they want. Basically, the, a few people at Netflix who were like, this is working anyway, why aren't we making these in-house? I don't think it's an accident that you know, Crazy Rich Asians, which was of course a huge hit, was also based on a hit book. Hollywood is a risk-averse industry and any proven audience is vastly more likely to get something made. Okay, so this modern rom-com revival is, seems to be driven by streaming services who are strategically overcoming the once limited commercial potential that once threatened to wipe out rom-coms entirely. They're doing that by mining pre-existing IP with sequels and potential spin-offs. But is cranking them out at the rate of superhero movies really enough to guarantee the next rom-com renaissance? You know, the kinds of classics that people will still love and remember 20, 30 years later. So I want to push this approach to its extremes in a way that I'm certain some Hollywood studio has already considered. We're using AI. I started by defining a pipeline for what I want, including characters, number of movies, and eventually a full script. Then I set up the OpenAI API and spent one long day defining some prompts for the GPT 3.5 turbo model. It was kind of surreal because I've done a lot of text generation experiments over the years, and the hardest part used to be getting a legible word, let alone a sentence. But with large language models, the output is almost immediately grammatically correct. It's just also, not what I wanted. <laughs> it used to be that when the output wasn't right, I'd spend hours debugging code or looking through documentation, but now when the output isn't right, I just rewrite the same question over and over again in plain English because ChatGPT is dumb. <laughs> I have no clue if this is better or worse, but I just feel like some parts of programming is changing. Programmers might need to spend less time searching for the right code to copy paste. They might even need to engage more with the arts to write better prompts. But they definitely won't smell like they took three consecutive all-nighters instead of one shower, thanks to Scentbird, who sponsored this portion of the video. I was always jealous of the people in my life who just smelled good. I didn't know how they did it, and eventually I just caved and asked them, and it turns out the answer was just some perfume or cologne. They treated it the same way that they treat fashion or clothes. It's an extension of their style. Hearing that, I realized that I wanted my own signature sting. But I thought searching for one meant huffing samples at the store or spending hundreds of dollars on bottles that I wasn't even sure I'd like. Luckily, I was wrong because Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that lets you try out new designer scents every month for just $17. It's like I have little potions. I got Not A Perfume by Juliet Has A Gun, which smells like how I imagine Imagine eating unpolished
polished gemstones feels like. Vanilla Black Pepper by Boho Boko, which smells like being inside during a snowstorm in your mid-twenties reminiscing about your childhood. And Metal Flower by The Harmonist, which smells like the color pink going through an emo phase. In an attempt to find my favorite, I've been switching between them for the past few weeks, and I've barely made a dent because they each come with a 30-day supply. Oh, but here is my favorite thing. There's this neat carrying case that they include that lets you just like pop in your perfume and it locks the vial so that you can't accidentally spray it if you put it inside of your pocket, bag, or carry-on luggage. If you know somebody who appreciates smelling good, you could get them the Scentbird gift set. Or if you want to try it out for yourself, you can click the link in the description and use code ANSWER55 to get 55% off your first month. Thanks again to Scentbird for sponsoring that portion of the video. Now, speaking of smell, it's time to figure out if our AI-generated rom-com stinks. Do you love love? No. What do you want me to say? <laughs> do you like rom-coms? Yes. Yeah. Um, if you guys go over to the Slack, you'll find links to three romantic comedies. I haven't read these, so Wait, we're what? going to- How did you make them? How did you make them, Sabrina? I did ask Mr. Chet, Mrs. Chet GPT. Cause it's about romance. <laughs> no. I'm looking at Love Trotter. Love in the okay. city, love in the country, love around the world. This is an increasingly desperate man <laughs> increasing their search radius on Tinder. <laughs> a trendy New York City boutique owner and a small town girl find themselves in a wedding planning. Rivalry when they both book the same venue for their upcoming nuptials. As they clash over decor and seating arrangements, they unexpectedly develop a deep connection that forces them to reconsider what they truly wanted. Love and life. This is like, this is Bride Wars. What? This is Bride Wars. Oh, this is Bride just plagiarism? Mm. <laughs> next one, next one. We now have Flowers and Love, which is a worse name. What Fresh about one. like, Wilt You Marry Me? <gasps> a commitment phobic woman decides to give love one last chance when she unexpectedly crosses paths with a charming but emotionally unavailable man as they navigate the ups and downs of modern dating. They must confront their fears and learn to take a leap of faith in order to find happiness. This sounds like the most generic <laughs> romance. <laughs> oh, these were, I forgot these were supposed to be good. Lights, camera, love. When struggling actress Lily lands the lead role in a major Hollywood romance romantic comedy. She finds herself working alongside the charming and successful director, Max. I don't like this already. Me either. <laughs> Despite their initial clashes, Lily and Max soon realize they have undeniable chemistry both on and off screen. On Why screen. is he on screen? <laughs> Why is he on screen? <laughs> Maybe he's an actor-director. No. As they navigate the pressures of fame and the pitfalls of showbiz, they must decide whether their budding romance is worth risking it all for love. That's a troubling power dynamic in my opinion. But I feel like we'd make a really fascinating story. There is a way for us to fact check this, and that From is by script. reading the script of this movie. What do you, can we do it? Lily, a talented and determined actress with a heart of gold, nervously straightens her vintage dress as she waits for her audition. This environment has never been ripe for abuse. <laughs> Casting director Lily, you've got the role. Interior <laughs> Hollywood film set day. She bumps into a handsome and confident man, Max, who exudes charm and authority. I'll dial down the enigma factor. <laughs> so he's got to so be really quick. good looking to, to make that line work. Interior Hollywood rooftop day. Lily under her breath. They're saying we're a real life Hollywood romance now. Max nonchalantly. Let them talk. Our on-screen chemistry is just that good. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. This is like just normal rom-com stuff, to be fair. Veronica slinking over to them. Will 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 looks like Hollywood's hottest new couple. Might just be Avielite after all. Max, open parentheses, disappointed, close parentheses. I have questions. Lily, I know this Lily might be crazy, nodding. but I'm ready to take the next step with you. I think I've fallen for you too. I can't believe you're making me read this. Well, you know, it was a good attempt. It was, it was a okay. Good as. It was an attempt. So a lot went wrong there. There was the plagiarism built off of unlicensed training data and the amnesia, having the two main characters confess their love to each other for the first time, several times in a row. But let's ignore that and focus on the fact that it was just badly written. It's upsetting because love in the limelight, a saucy enemies to lovers plotline navigating the difficulties of love, 
in the limelight has so much potential. The computer just didn't recognize that. In the machine's eyes, this idea is just as good and worthy of output as the boring idea or the stolen one. Now I did use GPT 3.5, so you might think GPT 4, its successor, would do better. It didn't. Now I'm not the only one who's noticed this decrease in performance, but because OpenAI isn't really open, I honestly have no idea why it's happening. But hey, maybe I'm being too harsh. While Taha, Melissa, and I can confidently identify a bad story, we don't really know what it takes to write a good one. So I asked for some help. Hi, my name is Adam Conover. I'm a comedian, television writer, TV showrunner, uh, and I'm also a board member of the Writers Guild of America West. Writing always involves staring at that blank page and it never gets easier because what I'm trying to do is create something new that people have not seen before. So I'm trying to give them the new thing that they don't even know that they want yet. But the... I think most important thing to remember is that writing is not just putting words on the page, at least television and film writing is not. It's understanding what can be sold in the marketplace, talking to an executive at a company, and taking the feedback from all of those people, talking to the actor and director to make sure that they like the script, making sure that the script is uh, on budget. Oh, hold on a second, this joke isn't gonna land. You know what, let's make a little tweak to the line right here. It involves going to uh, the, the edit. The episode is running five minutes too long, well, where can we cut out five minutes and still have the story make sense. All of those activities are a fundamental parts of writing for Hollywood, and that's something that not a lot of people appreciate. But the fear was that they would give us that chat GPT script, say, we need you to do all that other shit, but oh, you're not a writer, because chat GPT was the writer. So you don't get residuals, you don't get the pay minimums that a writer gets, you don't get any of those benefits, even though you're doing 90% of the same work. That was the fear. And so we put clauses into our contract, this is what we went on strike for, to prevent them from doing that. Someone might say, what if a large language model gets so good and the executive gets really good at prompting the large language model, figuring out how to put the exact prompt in to get the exact right text that they wanted. If they do that, they'd be a f***ing writer. I didn't realize how little I knew about writing until I had that conversation. I figured writers would consider it this sort of precious art form, but no, it is wildly practical. It interacts with co-workers and budgets and forecasting. Now, I made my AI rom-com generator because I wanted to see if Hollywood's increasingly formulaic and robotic approach to filmmaking could genuinely result in a good rom-com renaissance. And to be honest, I expected a flat out no. But now that we know that Hollywood is a business all about getting the right combo of story and fun Ending, we have nuance. Like, if streaming services are able to recognize that people love rom-coms and they decide to funnel a whole bunch of money into it, that's great. It solves the Iron Man problem. And if AI can help writers craft these stories, that's not a bad thing either, as long as everybody who's involved is fairly compensated and recognized. From the people whose work was used in the training data to the folks who are fine-tuning them to the writers prompting them. However, in order to truly create a rom-com renaissance, I think that we need to solve the problem I pointed out earlier. We need to find the fairy tale, but how do we do that? What you have to remember is it's not just humans writing television shows and making television shows, it's also humans watching television shows. Why do people watch things? It's because they like people. The best that you can do uh, is to create a very fertile, collaborative environment where a lot of people are bringing their best selves and you are facilitating that. With that in mind, I gathered some of the best storytellers I know and locked them in a room with me and the script. Welcome to the worst day of your life. I did this because I wanted to see my experiment through to its logical conclusion. Could a group of writers really salvage a good rom-com out of a process that was so heavily tainted by AI and the pressure for commercial success? Have you comment, liked, and subscribed yet, by the way? Uh... <laughs> Ready to bring your acting A-game today? I love how humans speak. <laughs> Things only really got rolling once we started ignoring the script. Or what if he, like, cuts her in line because he has to get to set, and she's like, uh, hello. But we did reference it from time to time. Just stay focused. <laughs> this all reminded me of how AI is already changing the way I work and code. Some parts are definitely different, even a little bit easier, but there is still a lot of work to do. Yeah, so it's okay because she's just being mean to a member of the crew. Right. I don't think we're creating lovable characters. No. Here. Let's take the power imbalance between Max the director and Lily the actress. Now, older rom-coms, which probably make up a majority of the training data, wouldn't really question that. That's the Woody Allen school of thought. But 
modern audiences would. So we added some details to balance things out. I feel like yes. Flop City. Flop City! I think <laughs> Flop City is correct. But we also introduced tension that could only happen in that relationship. And there'd be a scene where the actor is like, just like, professing his love and all of his deep, dark feelings. And then Max is just like, no, no you're not getting it. You're not getting it right here. Let me show you. Uh, and then he confesses his love to You should her. write this yeah. movie. This was my first time being in a writer's room, and it was wild seeing how rapidly an idea transformed. Is it insane when he's confessing his feelings to her, it ends with a kiss, and then he tells the actor to do it like that? Ooh. Is that crazy? <gasps> like, anyone who believes that GPT is writing because writing is just remixing things people have already said should actually try this. Wow, my Started beating a little bit. <laughs> you can argue about whether or not it's technically true, but there is something so special about seeing how quickly a person can communicate their knowledge, experience, desires, and taste just off the cuff. And it happened dozens, if not hundreds of times in that room in just two hours. As somebody who has wrangled GPT, a writer's room is a significantly more efficient and fun way to write. And even though we obviously didn't finish a full script in that time, we started with 36 pages of nonsense and finished with an outline of a rom-com that I would genuinely want to watch. <laughs> A fairy tale. And it's honestly kind of haunting my brain now. Like one of my favorite rom-coms just doesn't exist. It was just a conversation I had with some friends. Is this how Mary Shelley felt before writing Frankenstein? I don't know if you guys will ever see it. However, alongside my interviews with Scott and Adam, I'm gonna share the original AI-generated script. So if you wanna download it and get your friends together for a writer's room, check out our newsletter. And hey, maybe one day I'll do a full rewrite and then post a one-woman show on Patreon. I don't know, but either way, have a lovely day.